Well, welcome everyone to our urban design forum for April. I can't believe it's already April. So uh, my name is Gary Gaston. I'm the CEO of the Civic Design Center. And uh, we're really excited. This is, uh, we're actually wrapping up our uh, four part series that's been focusing on our 12 guiding principles. Uh, and we're thrilled to, to be hosting this tonight. I'm just curious from the audience who is this your first time to visit the Civic Design Center? Okay, that's that's a good percentage. So welcome. Our mission is to advocate for civic design visions and actionable change in communities to improve quality of life for all. And uh, this is our urban design forum. It's our monthly programming series and education series. This uh, urban design forum has been going on since the late 1990s. It preceded the Civic Design Center itself, and. Uh, we are, are thrilled to be able to continue to offer this program. Um, and as a way to engage really amazing people that are doing awesome work in the city of Nashville and uh, have conversations about design across the city and what's going on in Nashville and how we can um, impact change and make the city a better place. Our focus as an organization is in four primary areas. Uh, this event is an education event. We also do advocacy. So anything that we learn from these and want to promote, we work to try to um, have change happen in that capacity. Uh, Shaping the Healthy Communities is one of our initiatives, and that's all focused on how the built environment plays a role in impacting our own personal health, our public health. Uh, we focus a lot on mobility and land use issues. Um, actually, if you're interested and you don't have a copy, there's uh, a couple uh, different publications on the way out the door. Please take, feel free to take one of those with you. Uh, each book focuses on healthy communities and one on mobility and land use. And then uh, public space, reclaiming public space, both existing public spaces and new public spaces, and how to make them better. Um, I just want to, to recognize our presenting sponsors for the year, Amazon Global and Mars Pet Care. Uh, we have tons of other sponsors, but I um, just want to recognize our presenting sponsors. And uh, our incredible panelists tonight, uh, we join me here. We have Dominique Anderson, who's with Populance Community Strategy. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we have Dr. Kim Walker, who's with Abundant Adventure Club. Welcome. And uh, Lindsay Hansen with Waha. And they'll uh, give a little bit more extended uh, intros uh, versus me reading their bios and let them get an uh, introduction to themselves. So uh, if you are, if you're online, this is a hybrid bit tonight, so if you're online or if you're in the audience, uh, please feel free to, to engage with social media. If you do so, these are our um, channels and uh, hashtags. And also, I mentioned this is a part of our series that's focusing on our 12 principles, which uh, as a part of our 20th anniversary, which was last year, we actually took the original 10 principles, which are on the wall here from the Planet National, and we updated those and brought them into uh, current times, just revisited them through the lens of socially conscious design. So we wanted to go back and just uh, double check those. And then also we realized the 10 principles, two uh, major things were not addressed. One was really explicitly focused on affordable housing. Uh, if you imagine Nashville 20 years ago, it's a much different landscape than it is now. Affordable housing was not um, as dire a situation as it is now, but it, um, it just wasn't clearly explicitly addressed. So we added that principle to our, our principles. And then we also, because public engagement is such an important part of everything that we do as an organization, we made the very first principle all about public engagement and public voice and said adamantly that should be the number one thing that we do um, in any process. So that added up to 12, which actually gives us really great numbers for doing four months of programs for three week speakers each. <laughs> uh, and we're, we're, we're finishing up this month with um, our focus on expansion. So each of the, there's four pillars that are encompassed in those 12 principles. The first one is representation. So uh, who is being represented in the room and, and uh, how and what is the foundation of that? Or, and then foundation is the second one. So what are the principles that you absolutely have to have in place to have a successful city? Uh, preservation, the importance of what is special and important to our city that we preserve it. And expansion, which is what we'll talk about tonight. What are things that we want to make sure that we are expanding and growing in the city to make it more abundant and better connected? 
And uh, so the, the format is each speaker has been invited to take a specific um, principle and they will um, give a short presentation about their work focused on that principle and then we'll have time for discussion afterwards. And then after that, please help yourself for drinks and we'll have a little time to, to mix and mingle since we're all back together again. Um, cool. All right. So with that, we have our first principle, which is supply housing options for diverse incomes and lifestyles that complement the neighborhood. And each principle has a series of underlying goals and a few aspects that relate to that principle are things like inclusionary zoning, higher density near centers, uh, and maintaining identity with density. So tell me, tell us more about yourself and then talk about what you're doing. Fantastic. So I'm Germany Anderson. I wear a couple of hats all the time. Um, I am the executive director for the Tennessee Affordable Housing Coalition across the state. So I drive in to Memphis all the time and live here and then go to East Tennessee. It's, it's an incredibly crazy schedule. Um, and then I also am the founder and CEO of Pocket Community Strategies. And we focus on growth and affordable housing and um, diverse communities and work with for profit developers, nonprofits, um, governments, municipalities, and quasi governmental agencies. I really like that, that term. Um, I think I aspire to start a quasi governmental agency. So the work that I do is, is strongly based in community. I'm native Nashville. Imagine that engineer is not a lot of us, but knowing that areas like North Nashville um, are kind of the last areas for the ground zero for saving from the last bits of negative gentrification. Um, and notice that I said negative gentrification, that's a whole other conversation. Um, that's that's the work I do. I, I wanted to touch on a couple of things. Do you better if I touch on the things yeah, you have on the side? Absolutely. So is everybody clear with what inclusionary zoning is? And the, so inclusionary zoning is when you put together, look at the, the zone and the, the population of an area, how are you making affordable housing? How are you making that necessary and law, right? How are you making people do that? Um, Tennessee had an opportunity to have inclusionary zoning and it was it was shot down, which um, there are people that do this every day. I'll tell you a little bit more. I like to keep it at kind of a maybe a fifth grade level because I don't want to start talking about what I was going to go far. High density near centers, higher density. So that's important because if you live far, so I grew up in Mount Juliet, right? So Mount Juliet was never happening growing up. Um, I'm of age, so there was nothing there. Coming in town, and my home church was Christ Church Cathedral. Right, so the cradle is coming in from Mount Julia. It was an easy drive, it was a Sunday. Now it's an hour, mm -hmm. right? And it's an hour when I worked at Vanderbilt, it was an hour. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, maintaining identity with density. North Nashville is a great example of that. How are you creating character, maintaining character of neighborhoods that are diverse in community, you know, and are natural to a city? How are you creating that culture without making a bunch of tall and skinny, like you a, a bacon man a city, right? And feel free to use that term anywhere you like. <laughs> so, what is affordable housing really? So, there's a, when you say affordable housing, everybody has a different version that pops up in their mind, right? It can be housing for individuals earning zero to thirty percent of an area's median income. So, what does that mean? If the area median income is sixty thousand dollars, then they earn none to thirty percent of that. That's a small number. So this is, you know, generally for people experiencing homelessness or very low income earners. Mm -hmm. They're important. They're not an asterisk, they're important, they're human beings, right? Mm -hmm. It can also be individuals earning 30 to 60 percent of an area's median income. Doesn't seem like a big jump, but it can be, mm -hmm. right? And that means a different type of housing opportunity. So your medical assistance, maybe your daycare assistance, um, they're earning just enough to pay bills and have little nothing left afterwards. Right, and so they're what we like to call the working poor. We've heard that term. That's in this space. The other group that may also be in that space. It could even be individuals earning six to eight, even up eighty to one hundred twenty percent. So you think if someone earns one hundred twenty percent of that area's median income, they must be living great. And not so much, right? What if 
what they're earning isn't keeping pace with the cost of things, right? So housing is expensive, gas, groceries, everything is outpacing their earnings, but they're still earning the same. So $60,000 seemed like a lot at one time, right? I was a teacher once in Memphis, and I, I felt like, you know, hey, I'm like in a class, I'm doing it, you can't tell me anything. And then you come to Nashville, and it's not the same thing, right? So that's where we had a middle class, um, but it's disappearing. And so now we have what we call the missing middle. There's a whole great website. I'll send you guys the missing middle. Um, check them out. So educated professionals, but their income isn't keeping up with housing surges and the cost of living. So that that's a, a bit of a misnomer when you hear, oh, we're making 120%, but that's still affordable housing, especially in Nashville. So what it is not always Section 8. It's not always uh, detrimental to neighborhoods. It's not only one type or group of people, and it's not something to ignore, right? So we know what it is, but most importantly, we should all understand what it is not. And it's definitely not something to, to frown upon or maybe it's not in my backyard. Only one more, let's check. <laughs> <Ding -ding. laughs> Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so uh, our next principle is expand park and greenway systems to, uh, to be comprehensive and inter interconnected. And some of the goals in that are inviting to all, micro mobility, greenway recreation, no car needed, parks for all ages. And so, what? Give us an introduction to yourself and let's talk about parks and greenway. Okay. Hey. <laughs> I'm Dr. Phil Walker. Oh, oh so sorry. I'm Dr. Phil Walker, and I enjoy Washington Park. I'm also an adventurer. I'm also a doctor of occupational therapy, and I'm also founder, co-founder of Abundant Life Adventure Club. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that soon. I wanted to first start off with a story, though. So, wellness through outdoor experiences changed my life. It ch also changed the life of my family and my lovely husband, the team of the Pants. Pants. <laughs> <laughs> um, at one point, burnt out, depressed, a little bit of dysfunction going on, a whole bunch of things, okay? So, we turned to outdoor recreation looking for a complete lifestyle change. Of course, in my education, I've heard that this stuff is good for you, but that was not in my, my lifestyle. So fast forward, our lives changed and we wanted to share that with other people. We particularly wanted to share that with the black community because of course, even on this day, I probably was the only black person Part. Um, so we don't oftentimes see a lot of people that look like us in, in outdoor spaces. However, with the disproportionate amount of healthcare issues affecting our community, and as a healthcare professional, it was really important for me to share what nature can really do for you, how it can transform the quality of your life. So Alongside my husband, we founded Abundant Life Adventure Club. Oh, look, you know what? This is one. <laughs> oh, my <laughs> word. <laughs> um, no, it's sensitive. So, we actually make up a community of about 1,200 black and brown professionals in Nashville that we get together every week to break away from the hustle and hustle of life and everything else that comes with that to get into the outdoors, to recreate, to spend time in community and have amazing wellness experiences. So as the, pre the next slide says, um, the different types of activities that we do, we hike, we bike, we kayak, we rock climb, we horseback ride, we camp, or we go rafting. We have a variety of wellness experiences. I'm going to click that one. I'm yeah, sorry. So we are all over Nashville and the surrounding area. We do some amazing adventures. And 
it has really transformed the lives of our community members as well. Um, in a recent survey of our members, 71% said that our experiences, their time in nature has noticeably improved their emotional and physical well-being. So I'm going to my next slide. Is that one with the yellow background? Yep, yes, that one. Um, no. I think it was just me. No. So I'm sure you all noticed, Is that one? Okay. especially during the pandemic, the outdoors really became a thing to a lot of people, even if you weren't outdoorsy. Um, so there's a growing body of evidence that said nature is vital to your health. So especially if it's made in the New York Times, Washington Post, and Fast Company, <laughs> you might find this in the box or newsletters. This is very important. So it's becoming a, a health recommendation. Someone to like, you should eat five servings of fruits and vegetables. Not judging anyone, but that's just the recommendation. So nature is time in nature is becoming one of those health staples. So across the world, there have been over 290 million participants in studies in over 20 countries that show over a hundred different outcomes positively how nature impacts your health. The findings is substantial. And I have joined the growing body of health professionals that prescribe nature um, to the community. So as an extension of being a therapist, me and my husband thought it's not just enough to tell people that you should go outside, it's good for your health, especially with a lot of barriers that face black and brown communities. We go alongside them. So we created the amazing experiences and we go alongside them and our we on average get about two to three hours of nature every week. So this is a Facebook status from Sunday. It is a beautiful day for Sunday. Yeah. Okay. So this lands to my guiding principle of expansion. This is actually from one of our members. Centennial is packed. I have never seen it like this, even back in old Sundays, rapid days. <laughs> <laughs> so I caught it early. I'm sure she got a lot more likes and comments about it, but it was an engaging conversation about there are more and more people flocking to the parks. They're giving these recommendations. People are found outdoors and through the pandemic. It's awesome. Our city is growing. It's time to expand. Okay. So I am here to leave you with a few ideas and whatever nature of work that you have to consider guiding you uh, in the future in expanding parks. So this is a photo of a natural space in the city. I think that it's very important that we bring more natural spaces closer to the city. Um, Nashville has oddly a 120 something parks. There are primarily as far as hiking trails and more places in nature, there are really only like four parks that offer that and they are on the outskirts of the city. Um, so if you live in the city, it, it's a little bit tougher to get to these places. So there are all kinds of creative ways to build nature into the city, whether one to get it on a lunch break or after work, but remembering we should all be in nature. I love to go to So um, that is what that photo represents. This is, it's important. Community is a really important part of our wellness. Parks play a really part in building community and creating places for people to gather, creating places that are intentionally designed for people to gather. So different sitting areas, other options, uh, which I'll have pictures as well, amphitheaters, fire pits, there are all kinds of ways. Um, but just offering, other than dog parks and ball fields, but just more intentional design about making places inviting for communities. Because um, obviously, I show to a park with maybe 20 to 30 people, and places like this really offer us an opportunity to engage. And connection. So
So this is myself on one of our recent adventures. Are we about to meet? Go. Um, we were having a meditation. So offering, just keeping in mind that different groups of people experience parts and want to have a variety of experiences in the parts. Not everyone enjoys the outdoors being in the same way. Um, so this is one way that is very meaningful for our community. Um, we practice a lot of mindfulness and meditation in nature, um, a lot of forest bathing. So having these types of settings uh, is important. And just really my takeaway is just different, different communities have a variety of experiences. This is actually in Warren Park. Um, it's tucked away. Uh, we have a, there are a variety of ways that people engage um, in our park spaces and green spaces. And this is, this lends to accessibility. This is a boardwalk trail. I've seen these in a, in a few different places, uh, but nature is very important. Oftentimes the terrain is rugged and is not welcoming to wheelchairs, but the wood is more of a, a natural element versus like pavement. Um, and it still blends well and, and just a natural therapeutic. Uh, so this is a way to, an idea to, even if you're not in a wheelchair, maybe you have some issues with, with walking, um, but it's just a little bit easier to run, to walk on. So that's something to consider. Also, signage. This goes into to being inviting to people and inviting to people who may have maybe new to the city, maybe inviting to people who are engaging in activities for the first time. But this is really something that we have an issue with here, um, especially in our more natural areas, that there's not a lot of signage and it goes to safety. People want to feel safe, they don't want to get lost. Nobody wants to be lost in those woods. Um, so, <laughs> Uh, more intuitive um, and innovative wayfinding uh, is very, very important. All right, so my take home message is really thinking of ways to expand um, and bring people closer to nature. It's really important in Nashville, um, and it's really important to connect our community to these enormous opportunities. Thank you. Great. And that's still well the presentation um, section that we did last month because what's happening in Nashville with the boom and development is we're losing some of these natural areas that could be future public, you know, future open spaces that haven't like yet been explored. So there's definitely a strong push. That's great. Okay. Uh, and our uh, final principle is uh, celebrate streets as places that address neighborhood needs and facilitate community interactions. And some of the uh, goals underneath that are connecting neighborhoods, mode equality, facilitate interaction, safe streets for pedestrians, and uh, safe movement of uh, So, Lindsay, introduce us to yeah. yourself and uh, take it from there. Yeah, thanks. I mean, I'm happy to, uh, Follow Dr. Pan because I think uh, something that people don't think about when they think about our streets is the amount of public space that they actually represent. So if we can use our streets in different ways, not only for the movement of cars, we can create public space and potentially park space, even if it's temporary park space in places where um, we don't expect it now or don't have um, the capacity to grow. So. Um, Walk Life Nashville uh, is where I work, uh, and we've been around since 1998, and uh, we're working to build a more walkable, bikeable, and livable city, and partner a lot with Civic Design Center, so I'm um, happy to be here today. Um, we do it a couple of different ways. Um, I work mostly on advocacy, um, trying to make uh, we work alongside community members to push metro government and the state government to make changes to our streets and also um, work to change policy to make our streets more friendly for pedestrians. But uh, we also have 
um, other staff members that uh, do programming in schools. We hold a number of large events and bike tours every year. Um, and we also host lots of fun events just like the Big Science Center. So today I wanted to talk about um, work that we are actually doing with the Big Design Center um, along Dickerson Pike. But before I get into the specific example, I wanted to put Dickerson Pike um, in the context of um, the city and our pedestrian safety issues. So the most important thing to know about um, pedestrian safety in Nashville is that when a pedestrian is killed, it is not an accident. There are actually very predictable patterns to where people are being killed in Nashville. And in fact, um, there's just 10 roads in Nashville listed here on the slide um, where the majority of all the deadly crashes have happened over the past year, the past 10 years. And sort of said a different way to think about it, it's 6% of the streets in Nashville that account for nearly 60% of all the crashes that kill and injure people in Nashville. So it's, it's we know where um, people are being killed and injured. And there are very simple solutions. This is actually from the Federal Highway Safety Administration. So um, encouraging things. We're seeing a lot of new guidance and policy coming out from the federal level, um, a lot of good studies, a lot of good research. Um, but there are really simple solutions that can be implemented along some of these dangerous streets um, that can have a really dramatic impact on reducing crashes and increasing pedestrian safety. But um, in Nashville, those changes have been very slow to happen um, along those 10 streets I listed. Um, and it's because our mayors, our departments of transportation um, have been overly concerned about the movement of traffic um, and traffic flow, flow and travel times. And these arterial streets that I mentioned, those 10 streets listed, there are big pipes and boulevards, and they also tend to be the redundancy for our interstate. So um, where traffic is diverted so here's a project I wanted to mention a little more specifically that we're working in the Civic Design Center um, on uh, Dickerson Pike. And uh, this is a picture, um, it's a snapshot, a screenshot from um, a website um, where we have mapped all the pedestrian uh, deaths in Nashville. Um, and you can see the locations where people have been killed learn a little bit more about the person who was killed in the crash and um, more about the location where the person was killed and really see some of the patterns um, in the design that I was talking about. Um, so um, this is an intersection where um, a gentleman named William George Cox was killed in 2020. He was 60 years old and he was trying to cross um, this segment of Dickerson Pike. Um, so it's five lanes of traffic here. It's um, uh, 40 mile an hour speed limit. You can see there's no sidewalks, um, that many of the businesses have open driveways and big access points. And this is very typical um, street for those streets I mentioned where we see people uh, being killed year after year. Uh, and the nearest signalized intersection to this um, location where Mr. Cross was killed is uh, a thousand feet north um, from here. And so, oh just yeah. to get an understanding of that, a thousand feet, put it in perspective of blocks. That's like three blocks, yes. three city blocks. Yeah. So you have to walk. Yeah. Um, and here is what the intersection looks like. So, you know, when you see some of these crashes reported quickly on the news, it might say, oh, they were crossing mid block. Well, what incentive do you have to walk to the intersection when it looks like this? So, this is what Dickerson and Park Lane look like in. 2020. And so at this intersection, actually, between 2018 and 2021, there were 22 pedestrian crashes that killed a series of injured pedestrians. So there's no increase of safety at, at the intersection. Um, so then we get to see a little bit of a solution. So this is um, this segment of Dickerson Pike. Uh, we are trying to uh, work alongside community members and with the Civic Design Center and the youth design team to advance some of those pedestrian safety improvements that we know are proven um, and that we know can really reduce crashes. So the um, youth design team came up with a design for this intersection um, that included crosswalks and some uh, extended curb extensions. And um, when they put in the application for the temporary solution, Metro Nashville actually went out and came up with crosswalks. So that was a very encouraging um, 
outcome that the city went in and did it first. And then here's what it looked like when after those crosswalks were painted, Civic Design Center and the youth design team went in um, and painted this beautiful art. Um, and then um, in addition to the immediate safety benefits we saw from this, um, we have been using it as a way to generate additional community input and ideas and responses to a survey about how we can really uh, accelerate improvements like this up and down this whole stretch of the green site. Because we know people are walking, we know um, people are being killed in Israel, we know the improvements have been slow to come. So while this is this is great and it's exciting that there's a crosswalk and there was some temporary art put in this fall, um, the intersection still lacks like the very basic pedestrian signal. So like the walk, don't walk sign is not here. Um, and it really doesn't have adequate lighting. So it's very dark at night. So there's still a lot more common sense safety improvements that could come and we've been told are coming. Uh, so really quickly, this is the next phase of our project. It's super exciting. This is not yet approved by Nashville Department of Transportation. We actually just put this application in. Um, but it's just another example of the kind of temporary pop-up solution that, that we can do while we wait for some bigger longer term improvements. And this is actually a plan um, the next phase from the youth design team that has a temporary pedestrian island, and what you kind of see on the right is a, a kind of pop up temporary sidewalk, too, because this area really lacks um, sidewalks. And this is by um, Rocket Ship Elementary. So while we were really excited to see the crosswalks in, something that we've heard from a lot of community members as well, not all crosswalks are equal. So some have, um, in this case, there's no signal. So when you have an unsignalized, crosswalk and you just painted a crosswalk, drivers don't stop. So even yeah. though this is right near a school, um, mm -hmm. we've heard over and over again that people mm -hmm. aren't stopping. So we're excited. Hopefully we get to pop this up in the next few weeks and then mm -hmm. we can measure the results and hopefully push through um, some new solutions to unsignalized crossings like this. Um, so I know I'm out of time here. So. Just ask like, a, a big question I want to leave with everybody and um, folks to think about is um, summarize what we're doing when we're not designing for people. So we in, in natural our pipes are multi-lane, 35 miles an hour, speed limits are higher, wide travel lanes, long distance between crosswalks, narrow non-existent crosswalks, and unsignalized crosswalks. So it's great to like put a crosswalk in. If it's not signalized and it doesn't really have a big enforcement or pedestrian spaces or um, you know any any kind of signal, we're not really going to see people stopping for it. So um, we need to think about more elements that we can add to our streets that are permanent, uh, that slow drivers down, and really put people first. Um, so, but it also doesn't always have to be those permanent solutions. So, uh, just wanted to share this is our open streets program. It's a, a temporary one day street closure. This was um, from this year in the fall, it was the second time we did it in North Nashville on Buchanan Street. Mm -hmm. um, and we're going to do it again this fall. Um, and this is a great way to um, get people out on the street and help people imagine. Like I started with, the multitude of uses that our streets can be, that they can be public spaces, they can be great public spaces, they can be park spaces. And while um, we really need to start prioritizing people and making changes to the design of our pipes and our boulevards to save lives and prevent injuries and make spaces more possible and bikeable, we can also use our streets for fun and temporary spaces too. Um, so I had my final slide, which is a fun slide that said, um, from our open streets event, where do you want to see more open streets? So right now, Walk Back Nashville does this event for one day, once a year. Um, in other cities, it's something that's sponsored by the city government. It happens for you know many, like in New York, it's every Sunday in August. And so there's lots of ways um, that we could be doing a lot more open streets with um, some more public investment. So um, where would you want to see more? Well, what we should do that survey for everybody here. <laughs> yeah, sure, we have a lot of I, just, uh, I went to Mexico City and they closed down their Reforma Street, which is a huge boulevard that goes miles through the city. It's like every Sunday. Mm -hmm. I think what's you know West End Avenue. Charlotte. Yeah. Yeah, um, predictability is important. Like was on a set schedule every year and everybody knew like, oh September was open streets. Uh, 
Um, maybe just to clarify, because you used a few things that many people don't know about. Youth design, National Youth Design Team is a civic design center um, program with high school students that are, are representatives of 16 high schools across the county. And uh, that is our high school level, like for students that go through our design or neighborhood youth education program in middle schools. Uh, if they're really interested in pursuing that more, they could go into this application process. So I'm just curious, explain um, a little bit about this collaboration between Walk By and yeah. the Design Center and how the student portion has been so unique. It has. So, yeah, we were lucky enough, we had decided to collaborate. Uh, Civic Design Center and Walk Bike Nashville on this Digital Bike Pedestrian Safety Study. And um, the youth design team had come together and got presented a number of different topics and information, and they were able to choose what project they wanted to focus on. And they were so propelled by the pedestrian safety issues that, that they experienced in their daily lives and what they learned from um, the team at Civic Design Center that um, they wanted to take up working on pedestrian safety and then kind of really zeroed in on the nighttime issues and the lighting issues at that Dickerson and Park Lane intersection. So it's just a really great synergy. And then what we saw, which was really exciting, that first tactical urbanism, that pop-up crosswalk and the pain there that you saw at Dickerson and Park Lane, that was actually the first time that the Tennessee Department of Transportation allowed us to do that kind of temporary pop-up installation on the on the pipe on an arterial street. And we heard over and over again that it was really the youth voice of that made it. So it was the passion of, of the kids and the fact that they had made this design and picked this street based on the data and their experience and what they heard from different community members and that we were really able to um, push through kind of getting something new done that I think has really generated a lot of good ideas and energy for the project overall. That's great. It's really exciting. I, I, I tell that story a lot about the T dot and the youth. It's like we've been trying for so long, and then this is oh, the wow. point of getting this happen. So, mm -hmm. right. um, this is a big toss up question. I'd love to hear from each of you um, housing, open space, transportation. They're all kind of so interconnected. Um, maybe just a, a few thoughts on that interconnectivity, maybe related to your own topic. Like, um, housing, the importance of being connected to the transit or walkable streets in this type of housing that we're also talking about too. So when you think about housing, you have to think of a, an ecosystem because honestly, all roads lead back no point to housing, right? And so everything from education to healthcare to transportation is all about housing. How close do you live to your school? How close do you live to healthy food options? So when you when we talk affordable housing, that dictates what someone's life is like, right? And the type of job they have, how often they're, you know, how late they are to work or how available they are to work or if their kids get sick. So right, the pandemic showed us how important all of that was, even being at home in a place that's safe, healthy, and affordable during a pandemic. So much more so, because you're trapped at home, right? So, so you're much just spaces so. immediately, public spaces around your house became mm -hmm. So much more evident, or right. the lack of it. When you got to see everybody in the house, <laughs> right. a nice great yeah. place to go. Right. Right. So, yes. yeah. And Kim, in your work, how much do you talk to your participants about the expanding the spaces accessible around them where they live? Or is it both that and also finding places like all across the city? Or what are your thoughts on the public space related to your, like where you are? Just to to kind of think back off of what she said, me and my husband bought a house about a year ago, and one of the top things besides, really, that was the top thing for me, was how close that house was to park in the Greenway. I am in walking distance, but I understand that that is not the opportunity for everyone. And just, I mean, it shouldn't be a luxury, mm -hmm. especially if, if we're saying that it is essential um, really to our health to spend time outdoors, to have fresh air, mentally, physically, emotionally. I mean, in all things, this is really helpful. But in people who live really, if you think about it, in the, the innermost part of the city, um, we have lots of you know, high rises and things like that. And 
people need opportunities to have nature. Mm -hmm. And you do have to get creative with that. Not to say we're going to, you know, not asking for necessarily Central Park in the middle of the city, um, but we do have to have access um, to nature and green spaces. Um, and one thing that I hear, even sometimes people are unaware of the spaces that we currently have. So that's a whole other issue. Um, but even increasing them, because a lot of times we go to park, um, in one sense, it's like sold out because if your parking lot is full, yeah, you break. can't get in it. Mm -hmm. The last thing you want is your car to get towed, mm -hmm. you know, and so it's like a lot of times the people who live in those areas, normally they're way out on the edge of the city, and most times they're not communities of color. Mm -hmm. uh, so it just makes it harder to access it uh, via driving there, parking there. I, I should have put that on there, parking. Um, <laughs> and just getting to know the different spaces and being invited to the space. Mm -hmm. If it's not in the community, if you mm -hmm. would frequent any other reason. Mm -hmm. Um, we've got another follow up there. <laughs> 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 uh, Lindsay, thoughts on connections to walk four by four and housing in four spaces? Yeah, I think, I mean, this especially there's seen that a lot to the extent. I think it's been really interesting just in the time that we've been doing the work, the number of properties that have changed hands. <laughs> and, and some of that is development that that's coming, some of it is redevelopment, some of it is promising affordable housing, some of it is an active negotiation with community members. Um, so it, it's complicated right now um, along the stretch where we're really trying to look at pedestrian safety. And, and on the one hand, um, there's an argument to be made that why don't we put some of the costs of some of these improvements on the developers and wait for the development to happen but then in the meantime, we also want to preserve what's there and honor what the people who live there want to see in that future development. So we need to accelerate improvements now. So I think it's, it's a really interesting point in time um, for how, I guess I have a concern that we're going to see some delays from Metro Nashville, potentially Tennessee Department of Transportation thinking that developers can pick up some of this. But then you also have to think, well, great, sure, like let's not spend public money, let's have developers pay for it, but then how does that add to the cost of the development for the developers that are trying to do affordable housing development? So I think it's, I mean, there's there's not a one fits all solution to what we're really trying to do with um, Davidson. Pipe work specifically is document what the people who live there, work there, are running transit there now want to see and would like to see in the future and figure out what pieces of that work can be accelerated right now with existing funds and what pieces of that work could be packaged up in a way to make us more competitive for some of this new federal funding opportunities that are coming down from um, the American Reinvestment. So there is going to be a lot more opportunities for funding um, from the federal levels, and I hope that we can position ourselves in the city to aggressively pursue it for places like the Brisbane Pike, Murfreesboro Road, Dallas Pike, and, and not wait for developers to, to do it uh, because we want the community voices centered in those conversations. And the longer we wait, the more people are in this place. Yeah. I give it a case study. It's a tiny case study. Yeah. So when you speak of developers and what they'll do or what, what they can do, um, Wedgwood Houston is a great example of when you use your voice, right? Um, developers, because they want to move their projects forward, will do A, B, C, and D. So when I worked with the group in Wedgwood Houston, um, there was a developer that came. I mean, there's uh, like 700 developers in Wedgwood Houston, right? I don't know how they're packing so much stuff in that way radius of sound but the neighbors decided you know what this is what we're going to ask for so the one thing that i would say is as a community a neighborhood know your voice mm -hmm. because you have so many opportunities to get what you want out of developments out of municipalities out of governments you just have to know what to say and when to say it 
right? And so things like community benefits agreements, those are the type of things that they ask for. They ask for the developers to put in 30% affordable housing, um, the green space, I know everybody's probably heard about all of that, the lawn and the great lawn. So all of these pieces are, we're all community driven. And so some of that, you know, remember that developers need to get in and out, right? And that's time is money. And so the more you speak your truth, you know, the more that you might get some things to add. Could you um, ex explain CBA? So community benefits agreements, I love them. Nashville's on its second one, right? And so community benefits agreements are just that. They're that agreement where, you know, the community is gonna have, you know, as neighbors and neighborhoods, I think we all want everything. Right, we want all the things we want you not to do anything. Developers often get a, a bad rap as villains, right? That's not always the case. Um, but a community benefits agreement is a legal document, done well, it's a legal document that says the community agrees to support this project if the developer needs to do X. It's all, almost always um, dealing with transportation and traffic um, and affordable housing and then character of the community. You have that opportunity uh, as an organization. And what's the obstacle for now for only having two so far? Two what? Two. Oh, two. well, one is people knowing that you have that opportunity. Um, two, it's cost because it's, you know, lawyers have been, it's, I think, the same lawyer this one has done both. Um, if you don't know, we, we did have a loose CBA with Houston, but it was an official document. It was looked at by lawyers and signed off by attorneys, right? And so that's a legal binding document. And, and it's really just telling you, hey, you have this voice. Yeah. Um, housing is just the most critical thing I think our city is facing right now because the, the prices are just going up so insane and um, you know those costs then are pushing people out. Um, and I know this is an extraordinarily complicated question, but if you were to have have your wish list for housing, what would your, you know, what can we do about the situation that we're facing? So my dream, if I were to build neighborhoods everywhere, number one, it would not change the character of the neighborhood. I would love to see people come in and there are opportunities still to buy houses that are, you know, Memphis has a, a huge white problem and Nashville has less of that because everybody bought up everything. But in the dream, there would be affordable housing that looks like the housing where, you know, my grandmother's street, the house looks the same, right? But it's just updated and it's, it's fresh where there are good open green spaces, right? So that we realize those parts and that people come together and it's a variance of um, incomes and lifestyles and thought processes, but we can come together in one space and uplift that community together. And that nobody comes in and feels like they're better than anyone else or they're gonna lift somebody up. That's, that's not really how that works. And uh, ways to make that happen? To do it. <laughs> you last week, it's all day, all day. I answer this question, well, how do you know if you do it? Right. right, it's the developer saying, you know what, I'll put that 30%. It doesn't sound like a lot, but if you get 30% of the time, every time they do it, that's, that's more, right? And it's also about, you know, developers can take a three, three to five percent developer fee. When you're talking about making money as a developer, you can get about three to five percent in the market rate. You can do ten percent, you have ten percent developer fee in affordable housing. So you actually can make money if you pencil it out, right? So this is I like that face because that's exactly what I get from developers when I tell them that this is the work I do, but it's it's there. So it's it's about being honest about what you really are doing and what you really can do. And then it's also about community saying, knowing. Um, oh, what's, what is Jim Fox group? Neighbor to neighbor has wonderful academies that teach you all kinds of things. I signed up for the Translate Academy. I just you know the things, but there are wonderful things where you can learn about policy and your voice and your neighborhood and your community and, and really go out there and make some impact. Um, what would you prescribe to us <laughs> or if you're giving us a uh, prescription for outdoor space? Give some suggestions. For you. Just do. <laughs> Just do. <laughs> um, but yeah, that is a good answer. Um, I know that there's a goal uh, for the park associations and cities to have. Uh, 
park space and open space within like 10 minutes of someone's home. Uh, and parks can look so different. So of course, my, my whole underlying theme is creating these pockets of nature um, and just being creative with the design. It doesn't necessarily have to be an acre upon acre, um, but just providing these green spaces in a different pocket. So I know you kind of mentioned like different news stories, but also probably every other day you hear something about a mental health crisis. Um, we've been talked a lot about mental health crisis in our youth. Um, and there's a lot of science that goes behind youth spending time outdoors, especially in generations where from birth <laughs> there's like an addiction to screens. Um, times are significantly different. So the amount of time, pressure, and the things that our children are exposed to on, on screens or just inside. Uh, it sounds so simple, like going outside, <laughs> uh, but that's just the way that we were created. And spending time outside, being children, playing, connecting with friends. There's so many things that they learn and so many things that are important for their development. So, I mean, I can go back to the students, but uh, yeah, just taking into consideration these green or blue, close to water, um, spaces in our neighborhoods, open lawns. Or... I think, I mean, I love what you're doing there. Is that you have you're making you're helping people I think take that first step right which is the hardest thing to do is the hardest and then you're you're introducing that to them and then I'm sure they're participating with you but then they're doing it on their own too right so they absolutely yeah so we cater toward adults um, but we're really intentional about our programming and how we introduce we we never go to the same place back to back. Um, so we go to a variety of places and have all like different types of experiences and many things on the place. Mm -hmm. So it's teaching people who have, for whatever reason, not engaged in outdoor activities or recreation and being in nature. This is what we can do. And normally they go out and experience, mm -hmm. you know, they take their kids or their friends and it's really growing a community of people who like to spend time outdoors for whatever reason. Uh, I did want to leave you with his story. I wasn't sure at the time. So, um, so one of our most active members, uh, she she probably comes out about twice a month. She is fighting stage four cancer, stage four lung cancer. Uh, she comes out and if I could think of anyone who is like the poster of thriving with cancer, living in abundant life with cancer, it's her. And how, this is not meant to make me emotional, but just how meaningful it is for her to spend time outside in community, practicing wellness in nature and how at this point, she's beating cancer. At stage four, it's not very common. So, you can see it. What it's doing. Absolutely. To so like read the research that says being in nature helps fight cancer. But did you know something? I'm emotional. You're emotional. <laughs> um, Lindsay, I guess to wrap this up before we open the questions, um, so I'm curious about the interaction between the work that Walk Park does and the thinking about streets and sidewalks and connectivity to open spaces. So uh, greenways are connectors between parks and uh, they are certainly a part of that system. So how to talk about that interaction between um, how you work and function in that capacity to thinking about the connections between these things. Yeah, I mean, I think in addition to thinking about you know, how our students 
could have more elements of nature, if we did have more, you know, street trees and more trees, more medians and some of the pedestrian safety features that I was talking about, you know, have benefits um, for adding nature. And also, there's actually research that shows that adding trees makes drivers slow down too, because it signals to drivers that this is a place where they will see people. Mm -hmm. um, Putting that aside too, I think uh, just thinking about um, the, the issues around accessing parks that we talked about, the parking lots, the, um, being able to walk to a park safely, and, and that's not just like sidewalks, although we definitely are missing sidewalks, it's also the lighting, it's also um, you know other elements that uh, make it uh, an inviting fun part of your adventure to get to the park. Um, we are lacking so many of those connections in Nashville. And I think the challenge we have is that uh, we also have so many dire pedestrian safety issues. So um, while you know it should be a both and conversation always, um, I think we've ended up over time with a lot of either or. So I, I really like to see in the future um, prioritizing the connectivity, the network aspect, and thinking about how, you know, maybe smaller improvements could really open up certain parts uh, and access to nature to a bigger radius of people in the neighborhood if there was that, that safety connection. Um, when we were working on the Health and Communities book, uh, one of the most fascinating studies I found was, I think it was done in Portland, but it was a survey from people about cycling. And uh, this is what I recall that, that 5% of the population will cycle in almost any condition. Like they're okay with that. But 60% of the population would consider cycling if they truly knew they were safe, like in a protected exactly. uh, situation. So yeah. even that brings up, um, you know, Nashville is just not there yet. But if we could, then we have more access to. From your homes to public spaces to where you're going to work or schools. Yeah, and when it comes to biking, I would be really excited to see more bike share stations and more opportunity to you know, not necessarily have to bike from your home or bring your bike in your car, but being able just to grab a bike in or near a park <clears throat> and bike to the park, bike around the park, and bike out of the park. Um, yeah. That's it's actually something you see other places. Yeah, we start with our organization. We providing gear is something that's really important. So we partner a lot with um, eCycle, and we oftentimes our meetup location is in a bike share stand. Just because we don't have a bike, we don't want that to be a barrier to you participating in bike activities. Um, so that is a really good point. We often bike from one park to another, uh, and sometimes our options are limited on being safe. Mm -hmm. um, greenways are typically the safe. People feel the safest biking on a greenway versus mm -hmm. the streets. Sometimes the bikeways are a little scary. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then sometimes there's a, a bike lane, and then it disappears. But then it picks back up. And then we, we sometimes we get double my bikes here, and it's like, well, where do, did you see that street? Where am I supposed to ride a bike? So, so mm -hmm. to make those short connections, it's like, well, I, we tend to, to choose the safest option, you know, versus mm -hmm. especially in the downtown area. Mm -hmm. uh, so. I think your group's gonna be a great focus group for a long time. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> Um, I'd like to open it up to questions from the audience. Um, I live in Inglewood, and um, we we had a council person who was really interested in getting our crosswalks and stuff done, and he did. Can you get the council person over on Dickerson Road to be involved in getting stuff like that for them? They definitely are involved. And we actually have had great participation from all four council members. Uh, so this is a two, what we're looking at is a two mile segment 
as they were saying, and there's four council members involved. Now, just like a small issue you mentioned is that many of these pipes that are along Stanger Street yeah. also are the border between two council districts. So I think over time that has to be easier. But I'd say right now they are they are very active in mm -hmm. um, trying to work towards pedestrian safety solutions. I think it's just it's taking some time. Yeah. Um, Um, I'm an architect in the town, this is for Don. Uh, so we often find ourselves as a liaison between the developers and communities and council members and the city. Um, and we actually just we worked through a draft uh, for CBA with Snap and Tag, so which was using yep. um, And I totally agree, they're the most, it's the best tool we have right now to go hunting for stuff for affordable housing and other things. But I'm also, but it also takes a lot of organization and a lot of people on my on my path that are willing to spend time and energy and effort to make it happen. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm curious your thoughts on two things. One, what is your ideal scenario for affordable housing in the city? What combination of private and public has to go into that? And two, where do you think it'll actually end up in terms of? And we know the city and the state go back and forth, and there's been efforts to you know. Uh, uh, providing development incentives and things like affordable housing reality, which ultimately is going to shut down and it's like in this, you know, purgatory in a way. Right. So I'm curious about your thoughts about uh, what's ideal and kind of where you think where you think you'll end. So maybe when, not end, but get to a better place. Sure. We'll move, we'll move forward. So let me just say that Terry at Tag and Shay at Snap are doing the lion's share of the work, right? And that was. I was just saying when we started that process, right? And, and have since before, but you know what looks great in housing in a community. I really do like mixed income housing done well. Um, there are studies out of let's say New York, right? So New York is just really clawing at the bit for all this mixed income. They didn't do it well initially. So you would have buildings that were sprung up in New York and you have separate entrances for depending on your income. So, you know, you have really wealthy people that go on the front door and not so wealthy people that go on the back door. That's not how that should work. That's not at all how that should work. But um, when you, North Nashville, again, is a, is a great opportunity. Um, my grandfather was a brick mason who built a lot of the city and it's now gone because it's a big city, right? Um, there is an opportunity. We've built so much expense inside of North Nashville. And I look at areas and I know where did you find this, you know, plot of land, but there's still an opportunity to build a variance of housing, right? There's still neighborhoods, um, 24th and Osage, 25th and Osage, over that area of North Nashville, there's still houses that are there, people won't budge, right? And that's also part of kind of the stand up Nashville credo, right? Don't sell your homes. So, what that looks like ideally is a mixed income housing that maintains the character of neighborhoods but fresh with some great options so when you come into a community and you say hey let's we're going to really make this great we're going to put a dog park in pause what about people parking right because people maybe those people don't care about dogs right or maybe that's not the main concern so we've lost the contact of, of dog parks and so that i think some of those signs of gentrification we know like negative gentrification um, Starbucks show up, your you know, smoothie kings, your dog parks, and all of these things, and you know it's gonna shift. So listening to people, people just want to be heard. Listen to what people have to what the community says. Make that inclusionary housing, right? Make the mixed income, which use, which use is important because you can also have opportunities for small businesses, right? You're confusing opportunity. And economic equity inside of communities. Um, and then what does it look like for people to really do that? Those developers, they really put the numbers, the pen to paper, it can happen. And it's a little less greedy. And, and I'll just you know say it straight because I was a first publicist once and I feel like I can fix something I say. But you know, it really starts at the top, and you have to be honest about your greed from the top down. And that's a lot of what happened to our city. We were greedy. And we chased this thing. We wanted to be um, Austin. And now, you know, Memphis wants to be Nashville, and I'm all over it. It's like, don't do it. 
So I think it's just being honest about your greed and then just really put that in the right and doing it. Follow-up question to that. So I was wondering how often you see uh, like a swap agreement between the owner of the house and the developer, because usually what happens is the developer comes over, they buy them out because they have debt or something wrong with the house, they cannot afford any more mm -hmm. neighborhood, and they just they give them cash and they go and they just do whatever they want. So instead of this, sometimes developers come over and they make an agreement that a person can, let's say, even the worst one, false skin. Right. Mm -hmm. So they offer one of the tall skinnies, or maybe they're like free housing some other places. Sure. And then they take like some sort of change in exchange. Yeah, you can still stay in the neighborhood, but the newer house, everything is better, renovated, but the developer also wins because they get an extra without paying the lot. They, they can get an extra housing. Mm -hmm. uh, do you see this at all? Or is it because numbers don't work or uh, there's another reason or just no one thought about it maybe? Um, I think that's going to go back to my greed, right? So it's it's cheaper and easier if you can just buy somebody out of their house and just displace them. And because Stand Up National is doing, again, a really great job of telling people, understand what that $50,000 means to you. Mm -hmm. and number one, your house, you're undervaluing your house by an incredible amount. And number two, when you get that money, where are you going to go? Mm -hmm. And that developer's not always going to think about that. It would be great. Um, there was a project I know, the developer bought a house, um, I suppose the rehab is where it's down, but the gentleman that lived in the house, they rehoused him. Now, Memphis is ground zero for projects, large projects, where they rehouse people, and it's, it didn't really work out well, because what you've done is not taking people out of where they're familiar, and put them in a whole new area where they're unfamiliar, and so there's tensions. So it's really thinking through that process. Of where does that individual go? I'm a developer, I want this piece of land. A, I'm going to pay them fairly. B, am I going to tell them this is what's going to happen? C, am I going to ask them, you know, what's next for you? There's, there's like human steps that stop that. So, so that's a great concept, but human steps stop that. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Rehousing doesn't work on the, like if they move somewhere else. They, right. They're supposed to stay in the same area, but there's no whole logic right. of things. Right. Um, I, I I would understand that the numbers may not work as this, right. but I know like for example North Nashville, there is a lot of people also got educated like thanks to a lot of people helping helping them and mm -hmm. telling them just don't move out, don't get the, don't right. accept everything. Right. So maybe, but still like there was a tornado, then now they can afford afford to you know wait it. Maybe they can solutions like that. They can just still stay in the same lot at least. Mm -hmm. But maybe a smaller house or somehow like better you know, mm -hmm. that they could stay in a secondary house somehow. So like the like a lot that would hold two homes. Yeah. So the developer would build one egregious house, right? And then yeah. one like normal human house. Or the apartment complex <laughs> bunch of houses too. Right. Yeah, they sure. Sure. Uh, so yes and right. Yeah. Shared yeah. equity maybe where shared equity is where you know you move when you move out of a house. You have equity in the house, but you leave some of that for the next people so it stays uh, permanently affordable for two weeks, right? Yeah. So there's maybe, but I, yeah, I can see that. We had uh, worked on a daddy mm -hmm. uh, detached accessory yeah. dwelling unit proposal okay. where homeowners could, the city could partner with them to help build a daddy on their lot. And then they, as the homeowner, would reap the benefit of the income from that mm -hmm. unit. And then it's supplying affordable housing to people. Mm -hmm. So two, then, two things happen there. One, before I forget, your person that you're gonna move into that apartment, maybe Miss Miss Sally lives in this house, right? And there, or there was a project where they were rehousing section eight, right? And they didn't understand that if Miss Sally lives in this this unit and she doesn't have lights aren't in her name, and she's not supposed to be there with somebody else, right? You're under a lot of things and you have to have. Um, government agencies to help walk through all those pieces. Mm -hmm. And then with dad news, so now Miss Sally lives in this, this house and she's been there for forever, right? And she has this daddy in the backyard or maybe not a big building. Now Miss Sally has to become a landlord, yeah. right? What does she know about that? How does she monitor that? Mm -hmm. Does she know about property management? All of these things. So there's, there's a line of that. And people just get lazy and they just go, you know what? Let's just go park right. Sounds, seems right. Yes. <laughs> 
<clears throat> so I really have two quick questions. One is for Dominique, mm -hmm. one is for Kimberly. I'm just gonna ask both of them real quick. So that we know there's a negative uh, stigma on affordable housing, right? Mm -hmm. right? But you talk about what it is not. Mm -hmm. So what can um, Nashville, the city do to educate people more uh, about what it is not and actually uh, let people know. The reason why I say that because I've seen where there is a, a affordable housing coming to Nashville mm -hmm. and it was shared on the Facebook groups, but uh, people started with the negative stigma. Mm -hmm. And but basically it was saying this uh, family may have uh, $30,000 as far as the total family income. And this amount of people may have forty dollars or $50,000 of total family income, but there was still negative stigma. And the next question is, and basically how do we how does the city or do you feel educate people about what it is not? And as far as Kim, as far as uh, open spaces and parks, like what do you feel like the actual Metro Nashville parks or just the city as well could do to make people more aware of the spaces that are actually in the community that, that they can take advantage of? So. Yeah. Come on. <clears throat> I'm just testing. I know. <laughs> <It's fine. laughs> <That's what laughs> <I'm talking. laughs> um, but we we have this conversation often, often about just increasing awareness uh, and because really as people get connected to the different spaces increase their awareness it becomes more important to them we tend to want to cherish and protect the spaces we first have to be aware of it though um, but in terms of it really goes in essence to building community having conversations like this really is the first step Building awareness and building community. Real simple stuff makes the impact. Having open forums, having conversations, and extending invitations. Um, so we have amazing partnerships that develop that we have with the Fund of Life Adventure Club through an introduction, a conversation, and an invitation. Game changing, revolutionary days. Um, so extending invitations to other community groups, other organizations, other churches, it, I mean, it, it really builds bridges and then you can education, advocacy, things like that just become a lot easier by connecting, conversating, and inviting, really. So, just being, being people. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, the first thing in affordable housing is, you know, we, we have a lot of different names also, right? So there's what makes people feel comfortable. So affordable housing became uncool and uncomfortable. So then we started talking about workforce housing. And, you know, then people said, well, I'm, I'm this. So that doesn't really apply to me. And then we, we changed the name, right, to make it more comfortable. People. We have to make people, we have to let people be a little bit uncomfortable, right? And so the groups like, and, and not to shy off or shy away or kind of shrug off, groups like NOAA, right? NOAA is out here fighting the fight to get affordable housing, um, stand up Nashville. There's, there's so many small pockets. And oh my goodness, they can just come together. And that's where, and I'm not shameless plug, but the Tennessee Affordable Housing Coalition gets to talk to all of those groups as one voice. The other piece is, Legislating, right? We just did day on the hill, but we talked to eleven different, you know, legislative people, individuals, bodies, senators, representatives, getting those messages out so they understand that there's real seriousness behind it. Because sometimes the groups that are preaching affordable housing, my work is to be in the middle. I understand development, speak development, I do that, but also I'm very much a money making thing, right? Where the community is important. So when somebody has to be able to speak. That other side, right? It's not. It's not always just you know burn up the man. What you all need to understand: what, how does that impact people financially? Right? It's it's just continuously saying it and not letting people just say. It. Like the other day, I had a call with a gentleman. He, he said, "Well, let me ask you this." And I knew where that started when he said that. I was like, "Here we go, let's go." And he said, "Well, I used to have a bunch of Section Eight houses." And I tell you, as soon as I put them in the house, they just tear it up. How do you make them stop that? Mmm, you're fantastic. Thank you, sir, for that question. It worked out for me that I grew up in Mount Julia, so I was pretty accustomed to that you know, line of questioning. But 
So that's what we have to set by shift. Um, we, uh, a few years ago, did a publication called Affordable Housing 101 here, and we worked with a fellow from the Rose Institute because that was such an important thing, was like this question of what is what does affordable housing mean? Uh, and it's a really great publication, and I can share that with everybody. But the cool thing that came from that is that this fellow, while she was with us, it prompted her to, to actually create something called the Game of Rents. Kelsey, yes. So, Kelsey, yeah. so uh, I, 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 it's one of the most phenomenal games. Uh, it's like the game of life, but like it's focused on the game of rent. So it takes you through a scenario where you, out as this board game, you draw a, 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 basically your family and your job, and you have a certain amount of income, and you have to find a place to live in Nashville. And you you go around the room and you know in your as you're playing your game, everybody at the table is trying to find a house to live in. And it, the whole point of it was to show empathy for you outside of your own circumstance and really to put you in um, somebody else's shoes, right? That you're not um, you don't know what they're going through. It's really powerful. So I would recommend, I mean, that could be like a really great neighborhood association event, or if, if people are um, wanting to get together and understand affordable housing better. I think that's a really powerful tool. And they, there's both in person and then she actually created the Memphis one. Yeah. Was that your? I will die. I will die. I will die. Take so it's, uh, she's now created versions for cities all across the country. So that's really cool. Um, and with that, uh, I, we're out of time for the panel. So I would invite everybody to. Um, Stay around for a few minutes if you want and continue to talk. But thank you so much. This is incredible. So uh, just a few final things. Um, if the, what am I looking at here? Okay, blog. Okay, Miss. <laughs> This recent blog event, so uh, we've, we've become really active in trying to just talk about the, the multiple things that we're working on. So please uh, read more about uh, our work and the work of our great fellows and interns and staff members on our blog page. Uh, we are currently also working with Metro Nashville um, on the climate action plan. So we'd like to encourage you to uh, go on and fill out the survey. This will be included. You can find it on our website or on our uh, email list. And or you can use your phone and pull it up right here. I'll, I'll leave it up on the screen. Uh, and I'll just uh, say one final plug. If you're not a member of the Civic Design Center, please become a member and uh, become more actively engaged and involved. Um, as representatives, you can go back to your neighborhoods and uh, start talking about the things that we're working on too. And I'm currently working on our uh, next edition of Socially Conscious Design 101 course, uh, which will be coming this summer, our next cohort for that. So um, thank you all for coming tonight and stick around for a little bit more. All right. Thank you.